Martin, and we have taken you out of the studio. Once again, we are on location for today's episode. We are at Resurgo Place, and we are here to talk about the 50th anniversary of the Moncton Museum with Sophie and Lauren. Welcome to the show. Hey, Thank thanks you. For us. Yes. Thank you so much for sneaking us in early this morning before you guys officially open mm. <laughs> to get a little uh, sneak peek here at the newest exhibit. Um, for those of you who are watching online, uh, you can already tell there's someone very special behind us. I'd say. <laughs> so we're going to start today's conversation talking about Albert. Yes, Tell Albert. Tell us about Albert and why Albert is here in Moncton. So Albert's a special guest. We wanted to add to the excitement of the anniversary by bringing our friend back. Um, he was first here as part of another exhibit back in 1985 and was such a hit People kept asking about dinosaurs afterwards, like for years. Where's the dinosaurs? Where's the dinosaurs? And like we'll learn later, the Moncton Museum isn't really a paleontology museum. We don't really do <laughs> natural science. It's not really part of our mandate. This was a traveling temporary exhibit. Uh, but just to um, do a little nod to the past, we wanted to bring him back for the celebration. I think it's a fantastic idea because I know there's a real nostalgia factor for people who grew up in the Moncton area with Albert. I know my, my husband went, oh yeah, the dinosaur, I remember the dinosaur. <laughs> like, of course you did, you were like a six-year-old boy then. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't love dinosaurs, yeah. right? And for something that was here only for a few months, it, it had quite an impact. Mm. Um, we threw it out as a joke when we first planned, what are we going to do for, I mean, do we trace the whole 50-year history, you, you don't do that, that's too much work. You get exclusive, you start missing important things. So we decided let's just do some callbacks on certain things and I jokingly said well let's have the dinosaur back and I, I kind of started online and I found one in uh, BC at first and they wanted a lot of money for it but we <laughs> found a budget for it only to find out, almost signed the paperwork, I said there's a base in this picture. Is that included in your measurements? No, that would be in addition to, so all of a sudden this one we wanted was six inches taller than our ceiling. Oh my God. Oh no. A, a non-starter, yeah. Could, couldn't yeah. happen, right? No, no. no. So they said, oh, well, well maybe we'll find another one. Maybe we'll find a local mastodon or something. But no, it's got to be representative of what we had in the past. Mm -hmm. So digging and digging and digging, I found out that the, the um, uh, Thunder Bay Museum had one only to find out they bought it from the ROM that was in circulation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the actual one that was here in 85. And the reason it got taken out of circulation, it's incorrect. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. The posture, so they're signed, this is actually an exercise of scientific discovery as well. The posture that it's in is not correct anymore. It's actually more of a straight across kind of, as you'd see the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park, the way they would run their body would be a little Long, more linear, not yeah. sort of the Dino drag your tail kind yep. of thing. But since 85, the, techno the, the science has, has changed. So that's actually an incorrect posture. The bones are right, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. incorrect in terms of how it would actually be standing. Oh, that's fascinating. It is, and it's something like as a kid, you grow up thinking that's exactly how a T-Rex would, you know, in my head, this is how I expect the skeleton of, and I know that, that Albert's not a T-Rex, but he is, a, it's a smaller the cousin. Family? Yep, it's yep, yep, family. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Found in Alberta. That's why it's called the Alberta okay. Saurus sarcophagus. We call him Albert. Yep. Don't know if it's a guy or a girl. We've, we've actually had that question asked, so we did go back to the museum and, and ask that question. Don't know if they know or not. Uh, but we do get asked whether they're real or yes. not. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a resin reproduction. If it were real, one, it would be so valuable, we would never be able to get it on loan. Okay. Uh, if you go to a place like the ROM that has whole rooms of these, you'll see diagrams and even those high-end ones will show you the three or four bones that are real, real the versus the rest mm -hmm. that are extrapolated from, from discovery of multiple skeletons. Interesting. So very few complete skeletons exist and if they do, they are so um, rare that they're kept uh, you know, out of circulation. They don't, they don't end up they're at the Moncton They're not traveling around. They're not no. traveling around, no. <laughs> not no, the Moncton no. New Brunswick, no. But we're, we're happy to have something that represents yeah. a dinosaur that would have been here in Canada 71 million years ago, right? It's still really fascinating to imagine this. <laughs> yeah, 100%. How long is Albert on loan to our museum? 
the whole year? Uh, we have it uh, the entire exhibit until the end of uh, until January seventh. Okay. So early January. Write that down. Yes. <laughs> January seventh. Yes. Christmas yes. holidays yes. are here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is really <laughs> just like the the tip of the iceberg <laughs> of all of the neat things yeah. that you guys have pulled out. Are there a few others that you want to highlight for people about what? What might draw folks in as part of this traveling ex or well, there's another a traveling exhibit. Oh, temporary exhibit. Temporary. This one won't yes. really be traveling because um, it was designed for our 50th anniversary. If someone else wants to celebrate the Monkey <laughs> Museum somewhere else, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> um, another big surprise or big thing. Uh, is a painting that we brought back. So the first ever exhibit that the Moncton Museum had on display in 1973 was a collection of, of paintings from the Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal. And so uh, we looked into what was presented at that exhibit and selected one of them to come back. So we have an original Picasso here in Moncton. What? It's pretty yeah. exciting. <laughs> Whoa. It's pretty cool. It's very cool. It has yeah. its own room. Yeah. Sorry, Albert. <laughs> With security, lots of security. Yeah. 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 They're friends, but they can't hang out right now. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I know. Not something yeah. that you would, like, I mean, I hate to give us that, like, small town kind of feel, but no, it's but a small are. town kind of feel, yeah, yeah, to have an actual Picasso here. Whoa. Yeah. Well, can you imagine, though? So in 73, there was lots of, like, how many paintings? Like, I can't remember. There were, there were quite a few masterworks Like a works Renault, here, yeah. Salvador Dali, Monet, Picasso, all here at the Moncton Museum in 73. So that's kind of crazy yeah. to think yeah. about. Yeah. Well, it's amazing to have such a, an institution that can do both bring in works like that as well as preserve and promote our heritage. Mm -hmm. It's part of our mandate and it, it, it makes it, there's, there's two really target audiences. We want tourists to come and see Moncton's history, but there's Monctonians, the citizens, right? They, they have to come back. Mm -hmm. If they've seen the same static uh, display of artifacts over and over. It's not something, it doesn't become a destination anymore. So the Transportation Discovery Centre, uh, the activities through programming, and especially our traveling exhibits that rotate every three to four months. Mm -hmm. Give them a new experience every time they come back. Can you talk a little bit about what your mandate is and, and what really this museum hosts now in terms of Moncton's history? Right, and there's part of this anniversary exhibit that kind of explores that, the, muse the Moncton Museum's purpose in terms of what we collect, what we preserve, what we interpret, and what we um, present. Uh, so it, basically, it has to have a direct link with Moncton's history, uh, starting from the township in the 1760s up until now. But we're also not only focusing on artifacts, objects, you know, documents and photographs. We also are looking into the intangible side of things, stories. Um, so we're working on oral history yep. projects as well. So that's becoming more and more part of our part of our mandate and focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I loved what you were doing through, I think it started during the pandemic, you were doing videos around town of yeah, different places the and talking about, rigs, yeah. Yeah, talking yeah. about the built heritage and the stories that go with the places that we go by every day and don't stop to think about. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a heritage mm -hmm. conservationist, but to me, bricks and mortar are bricks and mortar. They're nothing without the stories that you can attach to them. So that's why it's important in our collecting that it's not just, hey, it's an old radio. What's the story? Why is that radio here? Why do we collect it? So mm -hmm. we did recently rehash our collection policy because back in the 70s, we had empty shelves. <laughs> we wanted stuff, so we took everything. Anything. <laughs> and now you run out of room and you go, ooh, we have 10 of those. I don't think we need another one unless it's so special mm -hmm. or so related to Moncton's history. And that's another thing that people really don't know about museums. I didn't even know until I started working in a museum. You go to any museum in the world and what you see when you pay your admission, you look around, averages at about 10% of the holdings of that, of that institution. Holy. Because the purpose mm -hmm. isn't to display. That's a side effect of these other purposes of interpreting, preserving, collecting, so we have storage downstairs that represents 90% of the things that we have collected and continue to collect. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's great to rotate in our exhibits so that we can bring things out depending on themes that we explore so that some of it can come out 
um, and be exposed to the public. And some are small and some are large. And, and uh, you know, every time we go through our collection thing, uh, often some sort of uh, the wall were these large, large, large pieces that we always, why, oh, why yeah. do we have this? <laughs> we're never going to put them on display. They're gigantic. They're on display. They're the first artifacts yeah. in 73. Uh, Assumption Place had already been built. So the, the old city hall that was the, the footprint of Assumption Plaza was being torn down. They knew they were building a museum, so they took the facade, num took apart all of the stones, numbered it, knowing they were going to build the museum, recreated the facade. But if you look at the ledger that we have on display, the first artifacts are the mayor's desk, the mayor's chair, um, the, the um, uh, platform that it sits on, some balusters, like large pieces of furniture that were down in storage. We've now sort of pseudo recreated the last city hall meeting in that building before it got torn down uh, for Assumption Place and becomes then part of the museum. So you can sit and put on some mock robes and, and pretend like you're the mayor for the, for the day. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> <laughs> I was planning for us to do that before we leave, to be honest. Excellent. But I, I love that because that's something that with Resurgo Place, you guys have spent a lot of time and effort to make a lot of interactive elements mm -hmm. that are things that you can touch and put on as much as there are things that you can. <laughs> yes. There there are a lot of those those tactile things and I saw there's there's a fun one with you were talking about the facade of the building. There's like a little like do it yourself, like see how fast you could put it together. The, the puzzle, yeah. That's yeah. the first thing that I made. I made some of the stuff here if we didn't already have it made. Uh, a lot of recycling and that wasn't tr trying to be cheap. It was people that have been to the museum many many you know for over the decades have seen that style of display case so why build new ones we have extra ones give them that familiarity that callback kind of thing so I made a mock facade and cut it out like a jigsaw puzzle and put a timer up so you get to build that that almost that first artifact really <laughs> before even the, the chair and the and the, the desk the real first artifact is the facade yeah. that they, mm -hmm. they, they built with the actual stones from City Hall. So you get to play around and, uh, and rebuild it, see how fast you can do it. <laughs> and how do you guys choose between what's going to be on display? Is it time of year? Is it anniversaries within the city? Mm -hmm. um, or is it just like, we got to get this big stuff out of the basement? <laughs> <laughs> this off for yeah. a while. <laughs> well, in terms of the uh, temporary exhibits that change every three, four months, um, we, because we do have two spaces that we explore with for temporary exhibits. We have a smaller space that we use for internal, uh, locally uh, designed exhibits with like community partners, like the firefighters. Um, we did a CN 100th anniversary exhibit, um, that kind of jazz. But for this space, um, we basically have three times of year that we aim to like work with. So. During the winter, we know that March break is in there, so we want to have something super fun for kids and families, interactive, sciencey stuff. Um, and then in the summer, we think about people who are visiting Moncton. So it can be, it can be. There's a big variety of different themes that we can work with there, but it's more kind of, I guess, adults. Like it can be like different types of visitors. And then in the fall, we want to focus more on local stuff, which is kind of why this exhibit worked really well with that schedule. So something that would really like interest our community mm -hmm. to come and check it out. Interesting. If you had to pick one item <laughs> in the collection, <laughs> Here we go. right now, the entire collection, <laughs> yeah. Pick, yeah, one thing Everybody that like, go to the basement too. <laughs> but like one that you're like, oh, I can't believe I get to look at this, touch this, tell people about this. What is one thing, not your favorite, just like what, what's well, the first the, one that comes to mind? You're like, the weirdest thing that comes to my mind, it might be the same as you, but we can have a couple yeah, yeah. different ones. But the hair the curler. The hair curler, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. The right. weirdest hair curler. We should send you a photo. I think it's yes. right behind that door. It didn't, it? Go, it didn't go back downstairs oh, yet. Oh, yeah. we'll show you later. It almost made it into this exhibit, but we didn't know how to protect it. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's taller than I am. It's like on a stand. And it's electric. It's got these, it, if you looked at it and I said, guess what this is, you wouldn't no. get, it had, what you would do is put your, put your hair in metal curlers and then these metal clamps that are attached to wires 
would clamp onto all of these curlers and then they would electrify it. <laughs> I feel like you're putting someone in the electric chair. I know. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's it's the like. most bizarre. It looks like a torture device yeah, or a weird please. octopus looking thing. <laughs> I, I love it because it's just so weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the strangest thing. It's not rare and I'm so happy that it's just so neat to show people and just if someone ever passes by, if I'm taking someone through and they see it, and I say, guess what that is? Uh, the answers are across the board. Yeah. That no one ever gets it right. No. <laughs> it, no. it makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and was that like someone's personal collection here in Moncton? That it was commercial. Donated? It would have like, been commercial probably. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it was yeah. How did it become, how did it come to our, mm -hmm. our collection? That's a good question. We'll know. have to look through. We, we do have that work. document. <laughs> well, yeah, I sent the ledger book out front. Yeah, yeah. Like, there, yeah, there's everything that comes yeah. in has a number assigned to it mm -hmm. and has the donor history and whatever other history we can we can get from it so and uh, we can't stress more like if you do donate something tell us everything about it mm -hmm, tell mm -hmm. us the whole story if you have photos at home date them tell us who's in the photos on the back right on it um, because the more details we have the more valuable it's going to be to tell those stories later on because like you were saying like we have like a like different I items that are just like an old this but why do we have it what's What's the thing that could have been a you know? fantastic story? That yeah, absolutely, yeah. Like, yeah. And like, yeah. in terms of like multiplying things that we already have many of, typewriters come to mind. <laughs> radios, typewriters, radios, right? typewriters. Radios, typewriters. Yeah. But if you so happen to have a typewriter that like Northrop Fry yeah. worked on, well, we'll take it. For yeah. sure, no hesitation. But it's just like, oh, an old typewriter. Yeah, this yeah, was just fine, but I wanted to write stories. Yeah, we're so. not an antique store, so just being old is not the pre Cisa, prerequisite Cisa. for, for yeah. being part of the collection. Yeah. Right? yeah, and also we want to start collecting things that aren't that old, if you think mm. about it, like things from the 90s, like in the 80s, 90s, that like will eventually need to be part of, you know, the story we're going to tell, so. You anyway. should get like a setup of Atari's. <laughs> Commodore, just, I've got a yeah, Commodore, yeah, uh, yeah, right? a VIC-20, what's the first, yeah, VIC-20 yeah. in my house. Yeah, yeah. So oh, the one that Pong was on, what was, or was that just Pong? The Pong with the two dials, yeah, yeah. 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 I would, I would yeah. come play that again. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like I, I send my old Game Boy to school when they ask the kids to bring in antiques. I'm like, yep, yeah, take the Game Boy, you can take the mini disc recorder. Yeah, oh, we're so Yeah, old. these, we are. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but you like, say 1990s. Well, yeah, exactly. 33 it's, years ago. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. everything yeah. I played with as a kid. Yeah. So, yeah. Really, you said there, there are stories that are happening right yeah. now that yes. the pieces should be in a museum. It doesn't have to mean that something is old or antique no, to be exactly. specially preserved. Yeah. It's the same philosophy as built heritage, too. It used to be anything pre war or pre 1921 heritage building. There are heritage buildings now that are from the 60s and 70s because of the context, not because of, mm. you know, why was it built, the style, who built it, materials used, association with the community mm -hmm. or science or religion or anything like that. So it's not about age. Mm -mm. Age helps. Mm -hmm. One of the boxes you can tick is age. Association, heritage value, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. I like that. So um, here at the museum you guys have a lot more than just what you see there and, and the stuff in the basement and the electrifying <laughs> hair color. But um, I mean, by that I mean programs, yes. right? Yes. We have a lot of programming that's happening <laughs> or birthday parties as well absolutely, happen yeah. behind the scenes. Can we talk more about what you guys offer in that? Yeah, capacity? absolutely. And we're going to have some of that highlighted in an event we're hosting in a couple of weeks too. So we'll have uh, a few things uh, um, kind of uh, highlighted. So we do have birthday parties, we do, um, we're working on education kits that schools can rent on certain themes. Um, we have partner programming in the winter called Discovery Labs where we have uh, community organizations come and offer fun educational activities. We had like the Capital Theatre Academy, uh, Brilliant Labs, Mad Science, Musée Acadien, etc. Um, so that kind of thing. What else do we have? Uh, we run Heritage Week on behalf oh, of the Heritage yes. Board. Yes. So yes. doors open events. That's um, coming up. Coming up too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Heritage awards. Um, so door scavenger hunts. Ooh, we, you know, yeah. things like that yeah. out in the city. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of yeah, that's that's one of my favorites. I love the the citywide yeah. scavenger hunt that you just kind of do at your own pace. Absolutely. It's not a, yeah. You know, anytime yeah. you've got the time. You can go online and, and look it up. But uh, partnerships are key for for us. We we love partnerships. Not only does it enhance whatever the th the thing is, um, but it just it just it there's buy-in. 
when and when other people mm -hmm. see other people buying in, they're more apt to buy in. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the the University of Moncton Robotics Club helps us with our robots that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been a partnership. We give them an honorarium to help them with their robot championships that they go to. But they come in and they service our robots mm -hmm. and redesign some stuff for us. So wherever we can find partnerships. Uh, we want to be involved with the community. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it brings different people in and it adds variety to our programming, so it's really good, yeah. And, and on that topic too, it's not just this one building either that, no. that is part of kind of the whole ecosystem. Do you want to touch on a few of the other special spots in Moncton? Mm -hmm. We manage three heritage properties. Mm -hmm. Um, the Trites House in the summer, which is the VIC, the Visit Information uh, Centre for Visitors. Um, the Thomas Williams House, which is also a tea room in the summer, is super popular. And the Free Meeting House, which is right next to Resurgle Place. If you want to talk more about, I guess, the heritage value of them. Well, I'm just th that the other thing about the Thomas Williams House is year round we actually rent the, the to organizations, mm -hmm. so Fundy Biosphere, mm -hmm, yeah. Italian Association. So the, there are community links there. We, it's a pretty reasonable rent for what they for what they get, <laughs> yeah. and, and they're always at the Thomas Williams House. So yes. uh, yeah. that's that's very very important. Uh, yeah, the the Free Meeting House is part of the grounds. It's the same civic address here, but it predates. The museum. Uh, in fact, the graveyard predates the Free Meeting House. It's the oldest public building uh, in the city, so it's kind of apt that the, the museum was built mm -hmm, right beside yes. it. It's pretty cool. And it's still used for events, like we have weddings in there, we have uh, holiday concerts, we're hosting a ghost walk coming up as well that will start in there, oh. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it starts at the Free Meeting House, yeah. it ends at the Thomas Williams House, but it goes around town. Excellent. And the yeah. Trite House story is the one downtown, right? Right, right on the waterfront? That's yes. correct, okay. yeah. Okay. Yep. yeah. And that's from one of the original settling families, yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Jacob Trites. Yeah. 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 It's probably its third or fourth location. What's cool about that one mm -hmm. is yeah. it's, not, it's not a mansion like the Thomas Williams House. No. It was sort of yeah. a, a small inn store, not high end by any stretch, but it survived. It was moved mm -hmm. at least three times, uh, twice in my lifetime, to where wow. it's finally now, but uh, uh, they dated some of it to the late safe at 1700s, another portion of it 1830s, so it's kind of morphed <laughs> over <Yeah>. the years. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a cool building that we own and operate yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. I like amazing. the current spot too by yes. the mm -hmm. title oh, board. Perfect, yes. Oh, it's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Perfect location. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So speaking of locations mm -hmm. and, and details, if people are now like, oh yeah, I need to make a visit to the museum. I need to see Albert and the Picasso. I need all the details. <laughs> Tell everyone about what, what they need to know to come visit or to find you online. So, well, to find us online, we do have a website, resurgo.ca. We're also on socials, on Facebook and Instagram. We do have a YouTube channel as well, uh, but most of the information will be on our website and social media. Uh, we're open from Tuesday to Sunday during the winter, and uh, yeah, come, come check it out. And we're right on Mountain Road, is the... 20 Mountain, 20 Mountain Road, Road, yeah. Road, Parking yes. off of Bellevue. Mm -hmm. Bellevue, yep. okay. Yep. Excellent. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. well, so thank you for your interest. It's I, awesome. Oh, oh, it's fantastic. Well, we're, we're done with the episode, but we're not done yet. We're going to walk around. You should. Yes. Yes. We'll show you the curler, too. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes, please. So if you want to see a picture of that, we're going to see if we can get you one. Check the show notes afterwards and our socials, and we'll see you next week.